Hello everybody, I'm Mark. And Margie. Thanks for joining us here at Flip Flop Flyer Headquarters at the North Perry Airport in Hollywood, Florida. What follows is going to be a detailed video of the pre-flight of the C-MAX. Uh, it's a little bit longer format than we typically do for our videos, but that's because it's very detailed and technical. And we want you to see all the nooks and crannies of the aircraft uh, as we see it when we go out to fly every time. In all seriousness though, don't get on an airplane with anybody without doing their pre-flight because your pre-flight is all about safety and that's where if you're going to run into an issue, you're going to see it there. And this guy, he's safety first. Always. Always. And uh, the pre-flight is your absolute last opportunity to catch anything uh, wrong with the aircraft before you get airborne. That's not the place you want to find it. Upstairs you want to have it found down here and deal with it so that you can have a safe operation. Thanks for joining us. Put your questions in the comment section. Uh, we'll answer as best we can anything you bring up. As always, See you thanks soon. very much. See you soon. Cheers. First, a few basics. The C-MAX itself is a fairly simple aircraft. It consists of a conventional two-place side-by-side hulled amphibious design with a pod mounted 100 horsepower road tax 912 ULS engine in a pusher configuration utilizing in my application a three blade Sensenich composite propeller although other engine and propeller options are available. It employs a composite fuselage and empennage which consists of a full flying stabilator with trailing edge electric pitch trim and a conventional vertical stabilizer and rudder, which also contains the deployable water rudder. The sponsons and engine cowl are also composite. Electrically actuated retractable tricycle landing gear are used for ground operations. The wings incorporate a tubular aluminum spar with aluminum ribs and composite leading edge although a carbon fiber wing structure is now available. The wing structure itself is fabric covered, making it light and durable. The wings incorporate conventional ailerons and electrically powered Fowler style flaps that deploy to a maximum of 35 degrees. My aircraft incorporates the fixed wing version, not the folding wing. We're going to go through the walk around on the C-MAX now. We're going to cover some basics of doing a walk around for any airplane and then get into the specifics for the C-MAX itself. So let's go for it. First things first, when we're approaching the airplane, we want to be looking for any pools of liquid, uh, any flat tires, noticeable damage. Uh, that's as a first uh, quick look at the aircraft to make sure that nothing's happened to it since the last time you saw it. In our case with the C-MAX uh, and with most aircraft, you'll have a pitot cover. We're going to remove that and head to the uh, cockpit. In the cockpit, we're going to do a couple of things here. We're going to make sure that uh, the controls are free to move when you move them on the uh, control surfaces on the aircraft itself as part of the walk around. We're also going to make sure, since this is a retractable gear aircraft, that the landing gear is down before we turn any electrical power on to make sure that we don't try to articulate the gear uh, while it's on the ground. That's a bad thing for the airplane. So that is in the down position. We'll throw some electrical power on, lower our flaps for a closer inspection, and turn our electrical power off. I like to start at the nose of the aircraft. Interesting part of this uh, airplane is we don't need a tow bar for this. It's easy enough to move the aircraft around just by grabbing inside the nose wheel well and moving it around. In this case today, I let it sit on the tail. This aircraft is very nicely balanced and with one hand, you can sit it right on the tail to give us a good look at the nose gear structure itself. Primarily in here, I'm looking to see that we have no damage to our nose strut itself, that uh, we're in an over center position, uh, that uh, there's no obvious damage to the, uh, con the control arm here, that our centering spring is in the correct position, and that when we move the 
nose wheel back and forth. So we just want to make sure it moves freely and there's no obstructions. That our little uh, nose wheel door is in place and the fasteners are okay. Then I want to look down at the, where the axle goes through and look at our uh, spacers here. Our, uh, and this is good, I'm glad we're seeing this today. We're coming up on our uh, annual inspection and every 50 hours I change the uh, wheel bearings. And in this case, this one's indicating that we're getting a little uh, chunky with it. When we spin the nose wheel tire, if our spacer spins with the wheel, that's giving me an indication that the uh, wheel bearings in there are starting to get a little uh, worn and sticky. This side looks really good. There's no movement of the uh, nylon spacer like there is on this side. Uh, it's loosened up a bit. It's not real, real tight, but you'd be able to go flying with that. Uh, certainly keep an eye on that in my next inspections to make sure that uh, it doesn't progress any further. Proper inflation of the tire. That all looks good there. And generally speaking, with any sort of inspection that you're going to do, you're going to look at all of your connection points that are exposed. In this case, our uh, lower connection, we have the through bolt and the nut on the other side. No sounds of rattling or looseness. We'll follow it up the strut to the top end. Again, we have the bolt in with the nut on the other side. No corrosion. We'll replace our cover, our pitot mass. We'll make sure that's uh, not loosened up, damaged, or obstructed. A lot of insects down here in Florida, so we want to make sure that nobody's building anything in there. Out to the wingtip itself. We're looking down the wing for any obvious damage. Under surface, upper surface, leading edge. Our sponson, its connection point as well. There's a through bolt up here. And we see the nut on the back. This tape is here to help secure the uh, fairing in place and keep it from sliding down in flight and keep it in an aerodynamic condition. Looking at the sponson, you will have a little bit of movement to it. And this connection up here is actually designed to break apart under stress so you don't damage your wing. You'll snap off the sponson first and prevent damage to your uh, wing itself. Moving on, starboard aileron. Check for freedom of movement. Make sure our bolts are through and we have uh, safety wire on there, keeping the nut in place. Checking our ball joint connection and make sure again, no corrosion, ease of movement. The through bolt is through with a nut on there. And the same underneath with the hinge, we have uh, safety wire holding the nut on. Moving on to the flap, you'll have a little bit of movement. That's customary. Again, we're looking through the, the hinge bolt, make sure that the nut's on. And we have another over here. Hinge bolt, nut's on. While I'm here, I like to take a look at the main landing gear. Same thing that we kind of looked at with the nose landing gear. We want to make sure there's no obvious damage to the, the retraction uh, mechanism itself and make sure we're in over center condition. We're looking at our shock strut here which is rubber donuts inside. And we want to have a little bit of displacement there. That's uh, perfectly normal right there and exactly where we want it to be. Looking at our hydraulic line coming down to our uh, brake caliper, no leakage here. Our lower armature of the landing gear looks good. Our connections to uh, the retraction mechanism are connected and good, well lubricated at the ball end no damage uh, or looseness to the, the gear door. And uh, moving from the caliper, looking for our brake pad uh, thickness, which looks good there, to our disc. Our disc moves back and forth inside uh, the posts that form the back of the bolts that hold the uh, two halves of the wheel together. And they float there because the caliper is fixed to a flange on the axle. It's very important to make sure that you have some movement of the pins inside those hollow positions, as you can see down here where I'm pointing at right there, you can see some movement. That tells me that's well lubricated and that we're gonna have uh, a nice floating disc in there so we won't get irregular wear or any uh, additional corrosion in there. 
moving aft. I generally save the engine compartment towards the end so I can check the rest of the aircraft first before I get to the engine and propeller itself. Again, looking at the fuselage, making sure there's no obvious damage from previous flights or since you uh, saw it the last time. Moving aft to the full flying stabilator. I'm looking at my connection from my trim motor through the trim control arm down to my trim tab. Looking for my through bolt that holds the stabilator onto its spar and make sure it has a nut and that's in good shape. You can see the far end of the uh, trim arm that comes down and attaches to the flange on the trim tab itself. We're going to check the stabilator for up and down play, fore and aft play, and in and out play. To make sure there's no looseness there, we'll check it for freedom of movement as well and see that the tab at the back of the stabilator moves in an appropriate direction to balance out the air loads. That's looking really good. Into the rudder, we're going to check our top hinge. Make sure it's uh, lubricated, that we have a bolt through there, a nut on the end, and uh, wire, which we do. Uh, the lower hinge, same thing, bolt through, nut on, and safety wire in there. And then we'll check the attachments to our rudder cables right here, which are their stays. And this looks good. No obviously binding or anything in there. We have a water rudder underneath, and uh, we want to make sure it's stowed and loose and free so that it will deploy when we want it when we're in the water. Other side, same thing, just checking both sides. And in particular here, the, the attach point for the rudder uh, cable. On the back side of the aircraft, we do have some openings that allow us to view into the hull from two positions. We have a sump pump. We've got a little bit of water in there right now. Most of the water that I find in the aircraft comes primarily from when I wash the aircraft. We're always checking the, uh, the sump pump before we start the engines to make sure that, especially if we've landed in the water, if there's any substantial water in the uh, hull itself, that would impede us from a normal takeoff. While we're over here to this side, we'll look at this main landing gear. We have our fuel drain right here that we'll check in a moment. We also have our sump pump outlet right here. So when we turn that pump on, that's where the water drains out. And uh, that pretty much summarizes the exterior part of it. Now we'll get into the engine itself. For that we need our fuel strainer. There are 11 Zeus fasteners around the exterior of the cowling. Six on the left side owing to the exhaust port sticking out the side of the on the left. And there are five on the right hand side. CMEX does now offer a a cowling that has access panels in it to allow you to get in and check your oil and some other components. I kind of like having to look at the engine in more detail when I go out to fly each time. It uh, gives me good eyes on uh, anything that could be uh, starting to show signs of wear or leaking, staining, lack of performance. Now we're going to tilt the airplane up again so I can get the cowling off without doing any damage to it. It's a process and it's a it gets a lot easier with time I'm learning how to do this. C-Max uses a 100 horsepower a Rotex 912 ULS engine in my application. Uh, in the light sport category, there is a fuel injected version available. Uh, adds a little bit of weight, but uh, I went with a, with a carbureted version to uh, save weight and have as light an aircraft as possible. 
Uh, if you're not familiar with Rotax engines, um, the Rotax has uh, four cylinders, 100 horsepower, and it's a dry sump engine, meaning there's an oil tank that is exterior of the crankcase where the oil resides. And uh, as a result, we have some peculiarities with the engine when we're inspecting it. We do what's called burping it to move any residual oil out of the crankcase into the oil tank so we can get an accurate reading of what the actual oil is in the engine itself. It's also a reduction gearbox engine um, in a 2.43 to 1 ratio. So normal crews uh, in this aircraft, I'm indicating somewhere between 51 and 5300 RPMs. You guys can do the math. I don't know what the, that equates to in uh, propeller RPM right now. Uh, it's also liquid-cooled uh, cylinders, heads, that keeps running temperatures in a beautiful state, especially here in hot uh, and sunny Florida. So let's take a look at the engine in a little bit more detail. Here you can see the reduction gearbox in the back here. Uh, this is your fuel pump. Fuel comes in through this main line here out uh, to your fuel spider, distributes it to one uh, carburetor on this side of the aircraft and the other carburetor on the other side of the aircraft. There is also two other lines that lead out, one that's to a return line because it obviously produces more fuel flow and pressure than what's required in the carbs. It uh, also gives us a, a line to a fuel pressure sensor as well. Uh, here is the oil tank up front. We'll check that from the other side, our radiator in the front. So with the radiator in the front, we're just checking for security of all attach points along the way. So we make sure there's clamps on there and it's not going anywhere. Uh, we make sure that the connections to the cylinders, which are a little hard to see, they're right back here and under here in back behind the plugs there. Make sure that there's clamps on those leading to the uh, water pump back over here and the return lines up top for each cylinder on this side as well. We're going to look at the carburetor. It's got a soft vibration isolator attachment here as well as from the carburetor to the, uh, the air filter. So we're going to check to make sure the air filter is not loose and that the whole carburetor assembly is not loose but does move a little bit. Our electronic ignitions up top are on vibration isolators as well. So we just move that around a little bit, make sure there's no clunking uh, looseness indicating a uh, deterioration of those mounts. Uh, going to the uh, underneath here, we have our starter. We are looking at our exhaust, giving a little wrap to make sure there's no looseness in that at all. This is, of course, from my front cylinder. This is from the rear cylinder, our cylinder head temperature sensors here. I'm sorry, our exhaust gas temperature sensors there. Looking down in the interior, you can see our engine mounts themselves right here, fore and aft. Our oil cooler is mounted underneath, making sure that's not loose, and we're checking the connections all around to make sure that they're, again, clamps at all connection spots so that we're not having point, points of failure in the system. Moving around the aircraft, on this side is the uh, oil filter. Again, we're checking the oil cooler connections here. Get a better view of the reduction gearbox on this side here. Again, our ignitions, dual ignitions, spark, two spark plugs each cylinder. Our coolant connections at each cylinder at the top. And at the bottom, they all have clamps. Our radiator connections starting from four, working aft, all have clamps on them, keeping them in place. Our exhausts are nice and tight as well. No hardware missing. Our carburetors again on this side, and a filter, making sure that they're uh, still solidly uh, connected but move with a little bit of uh, pressure and it springs all around. Our engine mounts down in underneath. And here's our coolant it's expansion tank right here with its uh, connection. And when I look down on the bottom, you may or may not be able to see in this that there is a little bit of liquid down at the bottom of it. Um, and it's vented to the inside of the cowl. Occasionally you'll see when we tip the aircraft back like this, a couple of drips of coolant down here. And that's from the steam coolant that um, 
uh, condenses on the inside of the engine cowl after engine shutdown. And when it cools off, it runs to the bottom of the nacelle and will drip out when you tip it back like this. All right, now for the fun part. I'm going to take our oil cap off and we're going to burp the motor. All right, so with our oil cooler cap off and the aircraft in a nose down configuration now, uh, we're going to spin the prop through. And spinning the prop through in a normal rotation direction will create some compression in the cylinders. That compression in the cylinders will bleed past the piston rings and pressurize the crankcase. When it pressurizes the crankcase, it uh, forces all the residual oil out of there. You'll hear an audible gurgle when you get to the end and just air is coming through and not oil going into the oil tank. And that's what's called the burp. And when that happens, we know we have all the oil in the system, or the vast majority of it, in the oil tank where we can check our dipstick in the oil tank for proper oil level. There we go. We got all our oil out. He's rag. Clean off the dipstick first. And drop it down in. And that's a, that's a perfectly adequate amount of oil showing right there in the range from my thumbnail here to my thumbnail here. My airplane likes to be run towards the bottom about a quarter of the way up and that gives me no oil, not, no appreciable oil burn at all. If I overfill it, it blows it out and I get stains on the side of my engine nacelle. Change the oil every 50 hours. In the course of 50 hours, I may go through 150 milliliters of, uh, of oil, so about that much out of a quart container. So it's really, really uh, um, good on the oil consumption as well. All right, everything looks good. So we'll button it up and uh, move on to something else. Get the aircraft into a tail first position, tail down position. Allows us to get the cowling back on easier. You have the propeller in a Y shape, that helps tremendously. As you can slip the cowling between the upper blades. Good glove. <laughs> All right. Again, we want to count these as we go. One. Then we'll go back and get our oily fingerprints off of everything. The airplane needs a bath anyhow. I had it in the salt water the other day and didn't wash it after we were done, so. We're gonna wash it today, but it seems counterintuitive, but it was raining out, so. All right, last thing, propeller. All right, three-bladed Sensenich uh, prop on this. They also do a warp drive one as an option. Uh, it's got a Steel leading edge, carbon fiber, and composite. Um, they really do take a beating in the spray in the water when you're doing water operations, particularly on your uh, takeoff run. They are subject to some, you know, uh, decay. As you can see along here, we've got a little bit of, uh, you know, paint and surface uh, finish coming off. Um, it's pretty pretty typical and normal and overall in good shape we're looking at our through bolts that attach the propeller itself to the flange these six go through the flange and uh, keep the prop attached these outer ones uh, help keep the blades tacked in position where they're meant to be there are pins that go into these holes here that allow you to, on the ground, loosen up your bolts, change the blade pitch of the blades on the ground. 
Um, if you want a steeper pitch, I think on these go from a zero to four, I think, as uh, indicators on the pins. And uh, I run mine at a zero or one. And uh, that's why I get good static uh, thrust and RPMs um, when I want to get out of the water as quickly as I can, especially at heavier weights. Uh, if you have it at a steeper uh, pitch, you'll get more cruise performance out of the aircraft. You'll fly a little bit faster. I'm flying about 90 knots. 88 is what I flight plan for and uh, burn five gallons of fuel an hour. Last thing I'm going to do is check uh, the fuel. It's looking really good. No contaminants or anything in there. We'll put that back in the tank. C-Max has two 12 and a half gallon tanks, one on each wing. They drain into a 1.6 gallon header tank that is behind the cockpit bulkhead. And then from there, uh, the electric fuel pump allows it to send fuel up to the engine itself where the mechanical fuel pump takes on um, the rest of the job. Inside the C-Max itself, as I mentioned earlier, it's a conventional hold design, side-by-side -side seating. We have a single stick in the center uh, that allows uh, control of the ailerons and uh, stabilator. There are rudder pedals on each side. There is a throttle that's attached to the engine on the pilot side or left side. And on the right side, there's a connection to the left side that allows uh, someone in the right seat to utilize the throttle as well. The instrument panel is completely customizable. I went with a mix of analog and uh, digital uh, equipment so that I'm still legal to fly day VFR if all my electricity and all my instrumentation fails for one reason or another. I carry handheld uh, communicators with me, handheld uh, transceivers, one in the air band and one in the nautical band, so I can uh, talk to people either in the air or on the water in case I need to. Our water rudder is situated right here. That's in the deployed position right now. You can see it out of the bottom of the, the rudder. <clears throat> and we want to make sure that's up for all landings and takeoffs, water and land, to prevent obvious damage. Biggest stowage area is in the center console here for all my knickknacks for our fuel filler caps or strainer, extra batteries for our noise canceling headsets, simple tools in there. The overhead tongue has all the uh, switches on it. Uh, you have a fuel pump, the uh, next two running forward to aft, the red one is a fuel pump. The next two are for the G5s on the instrument panel right here. Uh, the next one back is for the uh, multifunction display, which is a Garmin Era 760. Uh, then we have uh, our bilge pump, then our nav lights, strobe lights, and landing lights. Ignition's at the back over here. Our master switch is here. Obviously, our plug-ins for our uh, intercom there. And this is our landing gear lever. This is in the down position. In the up position, this would articulate to the aft and have the gear up for landing on waters. Over each shoulder, you have a, a tube, a sight tube for fuel quantity in each wing tank, which is really only accurate when you're about six gallons or less in each tank. I do have a dipstick in here for higher levels for uh, judging, for doing our weight and balance. You know, there's also a fuel valve at each wing route as well that allows fuel to flow out of that fuel tank into the header tank that's behind the cabin. Same on this side, we have our sight gauge and then we have our fuel valve to allow fuel to flow out of the left wing into the header tank behind there. The battery is actually right here next to the ELT you know, my flight paperwork and a cover. There's not a tremendous amount of storage space, but there's an adequate amount in here that allows us to get a uh, camping setup of uh, a three-person tent, two sleeping bags, two sleeping pads, four pillows, 
two chairs and a small table. A cook set um, and a water bla bladder. Well, the camping stuff weighs 33 pounds and fits in here wonderfully. Stacked to the ceiling, <laughs> bottom to top. It does limit our fuel capacity because this aircraft, this particular serial number weighs 830 pounds empty. The max takeoff weight is 1,320 pounds. So that gives me a 490 pound useful load. Good job, sweetheart, yeah, you're all sweaty. I am, it's hot and sweaty here in South, South Florida right now. So with two people, very light bags, like for a day trip down the Keys, something like that. We can usually put uh, somewhere around 20 gallons of fuel in the aircraft. It'll take a maximum of 25. If we are uh, going away for more than a couple of days, like heading out to the Bahamas to hook up with somebody on their boat or something like that, usually we're talking about 18 gallons or so of fuel, which is still plenty enough to get us out to uh, the various fuel locations in the Bahamas, such as Nassau. Uh, anything more than that, like when we're going to Sun and Fun, uh, we're very, very stringent about the weight that we're bringing with us because essentially we can put enough fuel in there to give us uh, half an hour to 45 minutes of reserve. You know, that's, that's, that's legal and it's ample, um, but it's a little disconcerting when you're unfamiliar with the airplane initially because, you know, if you're burning five gallons an hour, half an hour's worth of fuel is two and a half gallons. When you're down to one and a quarter gallons in each wing tank and you're looking at those sight gauges while you're still in the air, a lot of times you don't see that it shows any fuel in the tank so because it's sloshing around in there. But uh, having done numerous, numerous flights and kept track of the fuel burn, do that homework ahead of time, establish what your baseline fuel consumptions are, and when we land, we always have that three or so gallons of fuel on board the airplane. So it's a confidence builder to actually run it close to the edge and have it uh, work out just fine and have actually a little bit more than you thought you might have, so. All right, that is the uh, walk around in a nutshell. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us for the pre-flight video. I hope you learned something today and uh, gained a little bit more information about the C-MAX. Once again, any questions you have, put them in the comments. We'll do what we can to answer them for you. Have a great day. See Cheers, you soon. everybody. That's about it, I guess, huh? <laughs>